Wolbach, uh, thank you for joining me for this special election edition of Behind the Headlines. Thanks for having me. Um, just to let our viewers know, uh, this is a video uh, for the purposes of giving voters a more well-rounded understanding of uh, who you are, kind of your life, your experiences, lessons you've learned, and people who've meant a lot to you. Uh, so uh, first, the big picture. So of course, you are a city council member currently and have been for the past four years. Um, you've worked in government, being a field representative for State Senator Jerry Hill, and you grew up in the Midtown neighborhood of Palo Alto. Uh, technically okay. Palo Verde, but right next to Midtown. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm a fellow homie there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start with your childhood. I understand you're uh, from a big family and your parents were politically active. Uh, so I'm just curious what your childhood was, was like uh, growing up in the Wolbach family. Yeah, uh, so my parents actually met through um, uh, anti-Vietnam War activism, and uh, they moved to Palo Alto when I was two, uh -huh. uh, and I was the youngest of seven. Yeah, so definitely wow. a big family, but there's a big span, so uh -huh. I mostly just grew up with my brother Rob. Okay. Uh, we were the only two that really grew up in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we moved to the house on Greer when I was two. Yeah. Um, went to Palo Verde, went to Ohlone uh, for fifth grade, which was mm -hmm. great, mm -hmm. uh, and then JLS and Gunn. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, was, there was actually always a lot of talk about civics and politics in the house, uh, but I didn't really become personally passionate about it on my own until high school. So you, you grew up with good understanding of, or good conversations around the dinner table and listening to news shows, I'm sure, and yeah, things like Yeah, you know, like that. the news hour with, you know, the McNeil Lair, back then it was the McNeil Lair I remember news that, hour, yes. <laughs> and the news hour with Jim Lair, right? Yeah. But, uh, that was always on, uh, or often on during dinner. So yeah. I was kind of steeped in it a little bit. Yeah. Growing up. I understand your parents were, you know, role models for you, like many people. Um, their parents have a big influence on them. Tell me what they were involved in and what kind of characters and qualities they have. Sure. Um, so uh, my dad, uh, he was a biologist and a professor. Uh, he left academia after a, a long career teaching medicine to work for the private sector. And that's okay. actually what brought our family to Palo Alto mm -hmm. uh, when he got a job at Syntex, uh, which yeah, used to sure. be in the Stanford Research Park. It was a major company and a lot of Palo Altans either have direct or indirect connections with Syntex yeah. still. Yeah. Um, you know, it was bought out by Roche, and that campus is now the VMware campus. Mm -hmm. uh, so my dad was there. Um, and then my mom, she was very involved in a lot of education stuff. Uh, you know, you know, had always been um, PTA, Foundation for Education, before it became PI, right. uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and she actually started a, a STEM camp for teenage girls, which is awesome. Tech Trek. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And has I'm won some awards for that. She I has. She's won um, you know, some great recognitions for that. I'm super proud of her. <laughs> That's really awesome. Um, so beyond uh, the family, uh, I know you did some creative sort of extracurriculars. Uh, you were involved in theater and music. Is yeah, right? I, I did a little bit of that. Um, did children's theater conservatory for a couple years. Had very, very minor background roles. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the Phantom Toll Booth in elementary school, I think I played the fork in the fork no. of the road. Um, and uh, in uh, middle school, did drama there. Yeah. Um, I think the highlight of my uh, theatrical career was eighth grade mm -hmm. when I played Mr. Frank in the Diary of Anne Frank. Oh wow! Um, and then also did trombone. You know, did the band and for you know all the way through high school and did jazz band for a couple of years and jazz that was band. a lot of fun. Yeah. Did you guys get to travel at all? A little it? bit. A little bit. Yeah. yeah it was that's fun. fun. Um, so you had sort of a, a political awakening. Um, I know you've talked about how there was a newspaper series that influenced your thinking about party politics and policies. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, actually. Um, the first issue that made me really realize that uh, the problems in America and locally just at all levels of government were not just one party versus another, you know, one party bad, one party good, but were a little right. bit more nuanced mm -hmm. um, and sometimes stretched across the whole system. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a San Jose Mercury uh, series about the drug war uh, that really made me re-examine uh, some long-standing American policies mm -hmm. um, that were also practiced at the state level. They were not, or and at local levels, were not just exclusive to the federal government mm -hmm. and weren't exclusive to a single political party. Yeah. Uh, I realized there were a lot of negative consequences that came from that, and that was what first got me really personally passionate about politics. Yeah. 
And, and were there others around you? Were your peers also similarly interested in politics at that time? And no. No, no. no. It, was, it was a very uncool thing to be really into when I was in high school. <laughs> so you were kind of the, the policy nerd? Yeah, I was the political nerd, and everybody kind of rolled their eyes. <laughs> Not all, but a couple of my, a couple of my really good friends uh, and I would have really good conversations and yeah. you know, private discussions and debates, but... Um, uh, for the most part, yeah, that was not a ticket to popularity. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat, though. I mean, what was it about about politics or, or policy that really spoke to you at that time? I mean, I, honestly, just a sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. You know that sure. that we were putting so many people in jail for very minor things. Uh, that um, that we were putting people in prison mm -hmm. that were predominantly of lower income or um, uh, people of color. Uh, and that we would sacrifice so many parts of our Bill of Rights, you know, just to fight drugs. And then, you know, we saw after, you know, 9-11 uh, in 2001, a lot of the mistakes I felt we'd been making for decades with the war on drugs, mm -hmm. we transitioned to the war on terror, yeah. which was also really disappointing. Yeah. So social justice was one of the issues, I think, that, that kind of speaks to that. Yeah, so, social justice and civil liberties were sure. really big for me. Yeah. Um, so you chose not to go on to college directly um, after high school, which is in Palo Alto swimming against the tide for sure. Um, and I want to ask, what were you looking for um, in life at that time? What, what was your thinking going forward? Yeah, well, honestly, I was not a stellar student when I was at Gunn. Okay. <laughs> so I was just happy to, to graduate and be done. Yeah. Uh, and I was not looking at, um, at an academic uh, career. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked retail for a couple of years. I worked private security for several years, um, you know, into my mid twenties, uh, was you know, running security for a couple office towers in Santa, the city of Santa Clara. Uh -huh. uh, and that career, you know, there were, you know, I could make a career there in, uh -huh. in private security, but it wasn't terribly lucrative mm -hmm. and it, um, it wasn't terribly inspiring. Yeah. Uh, I was good at it. Uh, but I felt like I could do more with my life. Yeah, um, lucrative enough to have moved out on your own and yeah, you know, yeah, and I'd, live life. Yeah, you know, I was you know self sufficient. I was living in you know Mount, lived in Mountain View for a few years, then moved to downtown San Jose for a few years, and you know was enjoying life, but wasn't really feeling like I was contributing enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, since high school and throughout even into my twenties, I was always frustrated by what I saw. Yeah. in politics and government at almost every level. <laughs> and um, I you know, took a couple classes at community college to kind of test the waters and did yeah. really, really well, mm. uh, which was a nice change from when I was a gun. <laughs> and, um, what kind of classes were you taking? Uh, I took a, a couple of um, humanities classes. I took an East Asian history course and a US government course and a couple language courses, yeah. uh, Arabic and Spanish, just to Ooh, kind of you know, you know, test the waters uh, yeah. and did you know, really well. Yeah. Uh, and Decided to go back to school full time and to you know to study politics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd, I'd felt for years that I'd been complaining a lot about politics, yeah. and I hadn't done anything. I really hadn't done anything. You had opinions. I had opinions, right? <laughs> no action, <laughs> right? And uh, in order to you know, not be a hypocrite, I felt yeah. either I need to stop complaining or I need to yeah. do something, and I don't know how to stop complaining. That's just not in my DNA, um, uh, and so figure out a better at least you know, dedicate some portion of my life to, to government and yeah. to politics, whether that was a little bit over a long time or a lot for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I went, went to school, did community college for a couple of years, mm -hmm. transferred to UC San Diego, mm -hmm. uh, did really well. Yeah. Um, and then so political science. Yep, majored in political science, international relations. And, yeah. yeah. And you were also political director of the Campus Democratic Club, yeah, correct? Yeah, so I was um, uh, a political director for the College Dems at UC San Diego. And okay. that, was, that was a lot of fun, and kind of rebuilt that club and hosted you know, quarterly debates with the uh, College Republicans. Mm. Uh, we went as a group out to, uh, the Democrats out to Nevada. Mm. This is in 2000, and because, you know, going to school a little bit later. Uh, yeah. We went out to Nevada in 2012 to register voters. And, yeah. It was, you know, did a lot of a lot of fun things there and learned a lot too. It kind of sounds like you were finding your groove yes, in life at that definitely. point. Definitely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> By that point, I, I definitely, you know, was was on a mission to try and make a difference. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, now, at this point in your life, as I understand, you you kind of had two things going on. Um, one was your budding career in government and political action. The other was family oriented. Um, the need to take care of your father, I believe, who was um, who was 
feeling. And I, I'm wondering if we can just start with, with the latter for a second, because um, you mentioned this on your website that you, uh, when you came back here, um, you were taking care of him as well. Can you share a little bit about what that situation was? Yeah, um, you know, without going into to all the details, um, uh, you know, my dad was a, you know, he was a he was an academic. He was a really smart guy, and it was. I think a lot of people have seen this. You know, it's hard to see him have a, a cognitive decline that was accompanied by a physical decline that was you know several years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after I came back to the Bay Area after getting my degree in poli sci and mm -hmm. started working for uh, the local state senator. Uh -huh. I was looking for places to live, and uh, basically my mom asked if I could stick around and help because uh, it was getting harder and harder uh, with with what my dad was going through, and yeah. it was important. We felt, as you know, the whole family felt, it was important to have a couple people there. Yeah, and that meant that we were able to keep him at home until the end, that's uh, which great. was great. That's great. You know, and yeah. I think that's what he wanted, and that's what we wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, and every really the whole family pitched in, and a lot of friends too, a lot of neighbors pitched in to to help out. Wow. Um, you know, it's always said that you know hard times kind of forge our character in ways that maybe we we didn't expect, and I'm wondering if there's any lessons that you learned, or do you, do you feel like you changed through the caregiving experience? Yeah, I'm. I think more patient as a result. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> learned a lot. I, I, I'm not married. I don't have kids yet, yeah. uh, but there's you know a lot of uh, similarities. I think a lot of people have seen as they've taken care of older parents or or grandparents. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just you, you really gotta you gotta uh, put your pride aside and mm -hmm. uh, make some sacrifices and be and on pitch call in. when something happens. Be on call, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people in Palo Alto can relate to that. Maybe it's not oh, yeah. discussed <laughs> publicly. Yeah, that's actually something I, I did find is that um, as we were going through that and occasionally talking to friends and neighbors about it, um, mm -hmm. a lot of people said, "Oh yeah." We're going through the same thing. Or, oh yeah, we went through the same thing a couple of years ago. Know what you're going through. Let me know how I can help. Wow. Um, yeah, a lot of people deal with that, and it, we do have an we have an aging population in Palo Alto. I think mm -hmm. it's um, it's a common thing, and more people are you know for this reason and others are doing the intergenerational living yeah. thing. Um, we have you know two or three generations in a household, mm -hmm. um, and you know it helps keep people at home. Yeah. Well, that's neat to see how people. Are understanding each other um, and showing compassion and, and, and sympathy there. Yeah. Um, let's switch back to your government and political action work. Um, mm -hmm. So you were working for the state senator, and I'm just wondering if this is like you know uh, rubber to the road. Is that the right thing? Right phrase. Anyway, you're in. You're you're seeing legislation be created. Was the experience what you hoped for? What you thought it would be? Um, did you have any takeaways from? Actually, you know, working in government. Oh yeah, a ton. I, mean, I learned a lot, <laughs> I, um, uh, and uh, yeah, the experience of working for you know, somebody who I think is a really good, really great state legis legislator uh -huh. who's representing our area. You know, I was working in his district office. Um, I got to learn a lot about state government, about local government, about how they work together. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to be his liaison to Palo Alto and a few other cities in the area, mm -hmm. and really focused on. Uh, Public safety and education issues as okay. well, and so I, I learned a tremendous amount. Yeah, um, you know, it's I think like a lot of um, like a lot of fields, there's a certain amount you learn when you get your degree, but the actual application you get very little of until right. you go work in the field. And um, you know, I think I learned a lot more within six months of working for the state <laughs> legislature about how government really works, yeah. uh, much more than I did in four years in school getting a poli sci degree. Yeah. Was it more complex than you expected it to be? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it definitely. seems like things take a lot of time, and there are mm -hmm. probably a lot of moving parts. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely more complex, more nuanced, um, and just the the level of diversity in interest groups—not just special interest groups, but legitimate interest groups, community mm -hmm. groups, people who are concerned about this issue or that issue, and how uh, legislators, uh, good ones. Uh, struggle to take all of that input yeah. and you know try to pick the best path forward was was really interesting to to watch yeah. and be part of. I imagine um, you're also involved in um, the Democratic Political Party. Mm -hmm. Now you told me that you initially registered to vote as a Green Party member. Yes. Right. So so you switched. Yeah. So yeah, in '99 <laughs> when I was uh, um, you know I was finishing up uh, high school and able to register to vote. Um, yeah, I was so 
you know, this is back when I was like really upset about the drug war and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And I was just so upset with the direction of American politics. I basically registered Green Party out of protest, even though I leaned more Democratic uh. Uh, in my actual voting because there weren't a lot of Green people running. Um, but then in 2008, or 2007 or 2008, um, during that that big campaign, yeah. you know, that primary, I re-registered as Democrat and been a Democrat since. Okay. What is it, because um, a lot of people have you know, more Democratic uh, views and values, or they have Republican views and values, um, but what is it about working in a party and within a party kind of that speaks to you? Like, why are you involved? Because you've been very involved in, in various yeah. coalitions. and. Yeah, well... You know, again, I, I was disappointed by government. That's why I went to work in government. And I was not thrilled with everything that was happening on the city council. That's why I ran for city council. Uh, and I was not thrilled with, I was not 100% satisfied with what I saw from either political party. Okay. But I finally decided instead of you know, being a protest third party registrant, mm. the American system is a two party system. And changing that would require you know, probably constitutional amendments to change our electoral system. Um, you know, to have proportional representation in, this, in the Congress or the state legislature. Uh, so we have a two-party system. So rather than sit on the sideline and complain, again, I decided to get more involved and try to make the Democratic Party, you know, even just in the, the small pieces where I'm involved, mm -hmm. uh, more reflective of my values and just make sure you know, that I could add my voice towards the Democratic Party being more responsive and more true to what I thought were its best values. Yeah. Um, of course, right now, there's a, a big effort to make the tent bigger mm -hmm. um, and have uh, different philosophies um, in, this, in the party. I'm wondering what, what are the values that you've kind of held uh, for a long time and that you still believe are kind of core to who you are? Yeah, so my, my big picture, super big picture mm -hmm. political values are human life, human liberty, human prosperity, uh, distributed with as much equality and justice as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and... More specifically, uh, and we see this, I think, you know, right now in Palo Alto, and it's true for me with you know, why I'm a Democrat, is mm -hmm. things like inclusivity, being welcoming, being sustainable, mm -hmm. um, just a general sense of fairness mm -hmm. is really important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you think your values have, have shifted over time? Not a ton. I think um, my views on policies, I try to always stay flexible about. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, like you know, specific policies are like tools in a toolbox, and you should pick the right tool for the job. Uh -huh. um, but I, I try to be pretty consistent. I think I've been pretty consistent on my values. I think it's important to, to reflect on them, you know, mm -hmm. occasionally or regularly, and think, you know, what is really important to me? What is really important to the community? What's really important to this group that I'm involved in? Um, mm -hmm. And then to think about how you can take that, you know, those values and translate them into, clarify them into a vision, and then say, okay what are the best policies uh, yes. that would pursue that. That's a great segue. I was going to ask you to tell us about Corey's five steps to <laughs> policy making. <laughs> yeah, so a few years ago, I, uh, as I was thinking about you know, this kind of thing, and it was actually around the time that I was deciding to run for city council, and I was thinking about you know, what are we doing right in Palo Alto? What are we doing wrong? How can we improve our conversations? And I realized um, I felt like we had a lot of debates about specific policies, mm -hmm. and we were tearing each other apart over specific policies. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing happens at the national level. Sure. Uh, the same thing happens yeah. within political parties, right? Yeah. Uh, they form that circular firing squad. <laughs> and um, you know, there's a step before that that's vision. Uh, and some people really do talk about that, and that's good. And uh, you know, I thought, well, what's what underlies vision? And that's the values. So my the five steps I use, it's kind of my, my working model. Uh -huh. to, very simplistic way to think about public policy or value, vision, policy, mm -hmm. implementation, and results. Okay. So you start with the values. Mm -hmm. What's a vision that reflects those values? What are policies that can make those vision and make that vision real? Mm -hmm. And then go and implement it, mm -hmm. and then judge the results. And then mm -hmm. any at any point you can loop back to any point. And you know, if you get to the results, you say, hey, things around kind of stink. <laughs> How far back do we have to go? Or well, maybe we just screwed up on the implementation. Or maybe we had the wrong policies. Or maybe we never had a clear vision. And mm -hmm. so we were just haphazardly pursuing policies. And no wonder we ended up with bad results. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you, and I'm asking all the candidates, to reflect on the tenor of discourse in Palo Alto. Um, how do you evaluate it currently? And do you think that there's some 
way forward uh, if you think that there's something wrong with the tenor of discourse? I think it's getting better. Okay. Uh, you know, in 2014, you know, alongside talking about policy stuff, I also talked a lot about you know, how can we improve our conversations. And for me, you know, I, I we talked about civility and just open discourse, and as part of why I've been pushing policies with the city to improve city communication with residents. And some mm -hmm. of those policies have moved forward. Some of them have I haven't gotten the traction from my colleagues and staff that I've been pushing for. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important that we have good discourse, right? That we have these conversations as a whole community about our values, our vision, our policies. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we don't beat each other up if we disagree on a policy, if we still at least agree on the values. Mm -hmm. If we start there, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we'll have better outcomes. We'll have better conversations. If we start by saying, okay, you care about safety, I care about safety, for instance, yeah. let's figure out how to fix Ross Road, right? You know, yeah. where the people have been, it's been super contentious, as you know. Uh, the implementation, the policies are what we're looking at. You know, what did we do wrong? What could we do better? Mm -hmm. um, but we all agreed that, you know, bike safety, kid safety is the value that we want to pursue. So let's, let's start with that and then figure out uh, how to find a better policy forward. Uh, well, great. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention uh, about your life and experiences that we haven't covered? Yeah, I, mean, I think I'd, um, I'd probably be uh, you know, skipping something important uh, mm -hmm. in you know, talking about Palo Alto and growing up here if I didn't talk about um, our open space. Okay. <laughs> so just briefly, I'll, sure. I'll say that you know, uh, I did track when I was in high school. It was mm -hmm. not very good. <laughs> I've become a lot more, you know, I think I'm became more athletic later. Yeah. Um, You're a runner? I'm a runner. I, I do dual martial arts. I do running. I like trail running a lot. And um, you know, having those resources, the Baylands, mm -hmm. Foothills Park, Ross Tradero, having those available, uh, having my family take me to places like that regularly when mm -hmm. I was a kid, um, I think made a big difference, helped shape my values around sustainability, just mm -hmm. seeing those things firsthand, mm -hmm. being part of that. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of Palo Altans share, uh, especially people who've grown up here. You, you grow up so close to nature, even in the middle of a small city, um, and that makes a difference. Yeah. We're well resourced here, for sure. Yeah. Hopefully, we can keep it that way. Well, Corey, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure talking to you and learning a little bit more about your life. Thank you. I appreciate the time.